Hello everybody. Uh, this is essentially a reboot of this morning's uh, video uh, from Tuesday morning uh, with a little more clarity, a little more alacrity, and me having a script, which I like to work from. Uh, that said, uh, I will minimize the uhs and you knows, hopefully, although I can't guarantee I'll eliminate them completely. That and I will be blowing some text into the video, which should be helpful. Okay, keep in mind, as you are again reading this section two, uh, and this is to reiterate what we talked about in class, that there's a tension uh, in these readings between two diametrically opposed assumptions. On the one hand, we have the Marxist assumption and that uh, you're going to find in readings uh, 8, uh, Bremel and Friend, uh, and uh, reading 12, um, Inside a Japanese Transplant by Laurie Graham. Both of these readings uh, uh, stem from the Marxist assumption that workers and owners, in this case management as a proxy for owners, have inherently diametrically opposed class interests. Uh, this is an important distinction. The other perspective, what we can call structural functional theory, and I would recommend that you review this from your intro class or look it up online, um, assumes uh, consensus, uh, shared goals, uh, sort of working towards uh, uh, an assumed greater social good in which everyone will share, um, and, uh, and, and uh, unity of goals. Uh, there's no distinction made between workers and owners and, and, this, and, and their proxy management in this case. So, uh, we've already talked about reading seven. Um, we've discussed how the Hawthorne Motor Works experiment is often heralded shift uh, from scientific management of Frederick Taylor and the emphasis on the human side of the work process is purported by Elton Mayo and Roslingberger. Um, we, we've gone over that, we've viewed videos uh, Thursday, made by AT&T, documenting this process in, in the 1970s, when the workers themselves were in their 70s, uh, uh, them, and in which they documented the effectiveness of this experiment in creating what was perceived as a more humane work environment. Um, and so we want to uh, expand on this a little bit more and I want to do this with a little more clarity and a little more alacrity uh, than my initial video today. Uh, I'll be posting this and we should have text as well. So we've already talked about Humans. Uh, his, you know, uh, now Humans himself didn't assume that there was a system that must be maintained uh, and that there was consensus. He's just describing uh, the the uh, Hawthorne Motor Works in uh, Reading Seven, uh, you know, and and that um, uh, their findings there. If you remember watching the videos which assessed uh, uh, the Hawthorne experiment from Thursday, made by business school uh, professors both uh, for the initial discussion of the Hawthorne experiment and the subsequent discussion of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you'll see uh, the functional analysis inherent in those. It's not explicitly stated. There's no critique or there's no assumption of any sort of class clash and by social class, we're talking about the Marxist sense of social class. When we move to reading eight, Bremel and Friend, they have a similar approach in terms of Marxist critique 
that Braverman did in his critique of the scientific management school in our first sets of readings. They turned Mayo and Roslickberger on its head, its findings. After their detailed overview of the Hawthorne experiment, they challenged this rather sunny scenario of Mayo and Roslickberger that's put out here. Um, of, of workers being encouraged because of the attention paid to them, etc. The emphasis uh, in their articles is on the worker resistance, which was not discussed in any of the analysis of Mayo and Roslinkberger, uh, or in any subsequent analyses done by uh, people in more mainstream uh, business analysis uh, contexts. Um, their emphasis on worker resistance, workers were resistant, according to uh, your, your reading eight. Uh, the workers were resistant, to, and, 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 and the documentation of that was not there uh, in the initial uh, analysis of the reporting. The language uh, in the initial analysis, the Mayo et al., we'll call them now, the original researchers, reflects the milieu of the 1930s in its sexism. These women were referred to as girls, even though they were in their 20s, 30s, and 40s in terms of age. This, um, uh, if, if we can talk about how gender and social class in the Marxist sense intersect, uh, the, the quote, girls, the workers, were all women, and the, uh, uh, the men, they don't call them boys, uh, you know, the men were all, were, were all uh, managers, right? So, um, we have this situation. Uh, we have background information from Brummel and Friend, which wasn't used in Mayo's analysis. It was kind of like data that had been put aside. To wit, one girl, as Mayo and, and, uh, asserted, had gone Bolshevik. Uh, this term, as you read it, is another term which is synonymous with calling someone a communist and been replaced. So. She'd gone bolt of Bolshevik and replaced. Obviously, she didn't like you know what she was doing, or she tried to unionize the place or something. Other girls have been replaced because of what Mayo and his associates term. They termed the medical condition paranoia. Well, these people are had to be replaced because they were insane, obviously. But when in actuality, they, the replaced workers had a very real appropriation of the tenuousness of their situation, which involved being laid off. The conflict between the workers and the managers was always characterized uh, in, in uh, uh, Mayo et al.'s analysis, according to uh, Bramall and Friend, as something other than antagonistic class relations, which is what they call it. Uh, if there was conflict, it was because the girls were paranoid or the girls were misbehaved or they didn't, they, they had a bad idea. Um, Indeed, uh, paranoia um, was justified uh, because they correctly, in many cases, feared for their jobs. They hammer home, Bramlin, from the real point that the real goal of all of this is maximum output. They cite numerous instances of worker resistance, worker mistrust, the reason production increased not because of being flattered by the attention, as the original um, researchers uh, assert, and, and those uh, rather sunny depictions in the ATT institutional um, propaganda videos uh, you know, portray, uh, but because they feared for their jobs. Worker resistance came in the form of attempts by the workers to keep other workers from working too hard. When a worker works too hard, it potentially throws off the rates. In other words, a lot of time this sort of industrial work was paid piecemeal of other workers and diminishing the value of wage work and, and, and also posed the potential, if it was diminished enough, uh, of throwing a, a other workers out of work. So they term this rate busting. Okay, the thrust of this work, there was worker resistance. Workers' resistance was glossed over by the researchers, and if a worker resisted, they were merely replaced with another worker, creating as in what, what, what they called an inherent class bias. 
Reading nine, um, Douglas McGregor, I incorrectly call it McDowell in the earlier iteration of this video, returns to the structural functional analysis and we begin to see the effects of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, he, he contrasts uh, theory X is what he calls management, scientific management theory, with theory Y, his human, this, this updated human relations theory. Um, he says management is responsible for organizing elements of productive enterprise, including people, uh, in the interest of economic ends. So there's that, that, again, management. People are not by nature passive or resistant to organizational needs. They become so 